Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is the final video in our series on economic growth. In the last video we were looking at uh, why some countries grow faster and slower than others, and we're going to continue with that idea here in this video on economic convergence. Um, and what we see is a phenomenon where lower income countries, lower and middle income countries, grow faster than higher income countries, which we can see in this table here. The high income countries with growth rates around 2% or so, and uh, the low and middle income countries up closer to around 6 um, And so that's this idea of convergence. Um, our definition up there is the pattern in which economies with relatively low per capita incomes grow faster than economies with high per capita incomes. So let's get that down. The pattern in which economies in which economies with relatively low per capita incomes per capita incomes grow faster than economies with relative with with high per capita incomes. Whoops. They grow faster than economies with high per capita incomes. Okay, and so uh, that's what we're seeing here. Essentially, it's a uh, as if the, the lower and middle income countries are growing faster and converging or, or kind of catching up uh, to the higher income countries. So <clears throat> we're going to discuss a few um, ideas as to why that might happen. The first being this idea of marginal diminishing marginal returns. This happens a lot in economics. Um, and so we can draw a little graph here to explain. We have output there, inputs here. Things like labor or capital. And we see this phenomenon where um, as you add more and more inputs into the production process, it's going to increase output, but at a diminishing rate. Um, and so if you took, if this was, say, labor down here, and you go from zero to one, or, or maybe call it a million workers, um, actually, let's call this capital. Um, and so, starting with, whoops, starting with no machines and moving up to one or one thousand machines, uh, something like that. Output here, let's call this y, y zero, or let's call it y one. Uh, is going to increase by quite a lot. So this whole difference here comes about from adding even a single machine to a production process, which might not, other, not otherwise have had one. Uh, thinking about, in particular, something like uh, sewing machines. So if we had a uh, textile factory and everyone is sewing uh, by hand, and you move from zero sewing machines to one sewing machine, uh, that's going to increase output by quite a lot. Um, you come up here and if we're if, if we're at something like um, 20 and we go to 21, giving, given a fixed amount of labor, by the time we start adding more and more sewing machines, it'll help to increase output, but more and more that increase in output going from Y, that's uh, Let's move these a little to the side. Output Y20 to Y21. It's also going to increase output, by, but by only a very small amount. Um, and so, in general, it's still a one unit increase in, in input um, and a very small increase in output. We can aggregate this up and think about it on a totally macroeconomic level. And essentially, as we add 
<clears throat> more and more workers or more and more capital or technology into the national production process, those inputs are going to increase output, but at a diminishing rate. Um, so that's, that's this first idea, diminishing marginal returns, as to why um, some small, lower income countries, which have lower, um, lower levels of capital or technology, compared to high income countries where adding a little bit extra to the production process isn't going to increase total output in the economy as much as a, a uh, lower income country would by adding the same amount. So that's the first argument for convergence. The next one is technological improvements. And the idea here is uh, essentially if you're at the forefront of technology and innovation, in order to create even something completely new, you're going to have to totally innovate, totally come up with a new product or service or way of doing things. Whereas lower income countries, they can see examples of what works and what doesn't work and, ad and adopt technology that already exists. Um, and so basically being an imitator versus being a pioneer um, and lower income countries that, which aren't using the, the latest and greatest technology, they can just adopt those and then um, get a lot of the benefits from that without having to totally invent or innovate something new. So what we're going to write here is that low income countries can apply new technologies <coughs> Low-income countries <coughs> can apply new technologies oops, that have already been invented And high income countries need to invent or innovate something completely new. To advance. <clears throat> if they're if they're already on that forefront of the technological revolutions, and so because of this, uh, lower income countries can can look at and use the technologies that are out there, and that's another way in which we'll see that lower and middle income countries grow faster than the highest income countries. So we do see that phenomenon typically, but. Some of these low and middle income countries still do not converge, and that's what we have here, this idea of a middle income trap. Um, and so here, this is all normalized relative to the United States, so this dotted line up here, that's the United States um, economic growth normalized by itself, so any, any number divided by itself is just one, that's why this is one everywhere. And it makes for easy comparisons for different countries over time. So back in 1950, Ireland was about half of the size of the United States. Uh, Mexico was about a third of the size, and all of these countries were a little less than a fifth uh, or 20% of the size. Um, but we have seen some of these countries converge, economic convergence, but some have stagnated in what we call the middle income trap, and so what's the question, uh, or the question is what's going on here? Um, and this is going to go back to the original idea of what is required for any growth at all. So I just want to quickly um, write down this list of countries um, in order so that you can see them here. Um, the first one up here is Hong Kong. Then we have Singapore. And then the green line is Ireland, Singapore, Ireland, oops, <laughs> and um, Taiwan. Up here, the countries that have been more 
convergent than the others. Down here, the dotted line is Mexico, then Brazil, Ecuador in blue, and Guatemala. So uh, here's what we see on this graph, Hong Kong, Singapore, I Ireland, Taiwan, Mexico, Brazil, um, Ecuador, Guatemala. And the question is, why did these lower countries here not converge and the upper countries did? Um, again, that's going to come back to economic policy, free markets, convergence, things like the rule of law that we talked about before, protecting private property rights. And if we compare that ranking of convergence to this uh, economic freedom index, which we talked about in a much earlier video, um, here, ranking these, these are listed as they were in the index above. And so if we rank them by this index, the economic freedom index, one, two, three, four, five, at 67.4, Next one is Guatemala, 6, and then 7, 8. So there's a, a tiny bit of rearrangement, but more or less, the economic convergence in a country is highly correlated with its economic freedom index. And so last year, this was actually 2019, Hong Kong was the most economically free country in the world, as defined by this index followed by Singapore. That's recently swapped with Singapore as number one. Um, but again, it comes back down to rule of law, uh, the government, regulation, and um, open markets. So like we said at the beginning of, the, of this uh, economic growth chapter, these things are critical to have the supportive institutions um, and economic structures in order to allow individuals to invest, innovate, to have and, and transact with their, their own private property. And so the key takeaway from this, all of this, is that there's a high correlation between economic freedom and economic growth and convergence. So that's what we're going to write down here. There's a high correlation correlation between economic growth and convergence. Oops, sorry. There's a high correlation between economic freedom and economic growth and convergence. Okay, and there we have it. And so the countries that have higher levels of ec economic freedom, better rule of law, better judicial systems, um, more open markets, we see that those countries tend to uh, converge uh, better than others. So that is uh, it, actually, for this chapter, for this series of videos on economic growth. Um, here are just a few conclusions uh, that you can pause and look through. Uh, but these are all the things we talked about in the last few videos using real GDP per capita, thinking about growth rates and how quickly things double using that rule of 72, um, having those baseline fundamental rights and requirements in place, rule of law, private property rights, contract rights. Uh, if you have those, your country can grow, and your country will grow by even more the more productive it is. So we talked about labor productivity, and ended with this video here on economic growth and convergence. So stay tuned. In the next videos, we're going to be moving on to a new topic, looking at labor markets, so uh, unemployment and other labor market statistics, to start thinking about how do macroeconomists think about labor market health in an economy. So stay tuned for those videos, and I'll see you there. Thanks.